Welcome everyone. My name is Kynwen. I'm one of the directors at Shine Cancer Support and we are delighted that you're joining us today for our first webinar on donor conception to create or expand your family. And we're really excited we've got Nina joining us. Nina is a director at the Donor Conception Network. Uh, she's joining us from her house in North London where she doesn't have the heat on. And um, she's been at the Donor Conception Network for about six years. Um, so Nina, we're really grateful to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, just so everybody knows, you are on a Zoom webinar, which means that uh, we can't see you. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will answer them. Um, we are recording this session, but we won't use anyone's names um, when we're asking questions or, or um, sort of reflecting on anything that's said in the chat and the chat won't be shared either. Um, but if you do have any questions afterwards, you can email us at hi at shinecancersupport.org and we can, we can try and get those questions um, sorted out. So I am going to hand over to Nina now. We're going to do a presentation for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A and discussion <coughs> afterwards. So Nina, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kynwen. And, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to come and talk to whoever it is I'm talking to. I'm not quite sure. Um, OK, so, yes, I, I, I titled the, 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 the presentation in a slightly formal way, um, exploring donor conception to create or expand your family, which is really what I'm going to be talking about. But um, I did think another way of expressing it might be to give it the title loss, difference, decision making and building confidence, because actually those four elements tend to be the things that crop up for people. Um, there can be a big sense of loss, uh, there can be a feeling of uncomfortableness around difference, um, there can be a complicated decision making process, and it can be hard to know how to get some confidence in managing those areas. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to have a quick look at what donor conception is, um, who uses it, and who the donors are in this donor conception family. I'm going to have a look at some of the things that you might want to consider, the kind of feelings and issues that will come up for people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about openness, because that can often be a really major stumbling block. You know, if I'm going to go down this route, do I have to tell anybody? Do I have to tell the child? How on earth am I going to do that? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our charity, the DC Network, and what we can offer and how we can help people, and then hopefully conclude by giving you some thoughts on how to build that confidence and how to take your next steps if you're actually contemplating going forward or, or investigating. Okay, so donor conception. Basically, to make a baby, you need a certain set of ingredients. So you'll need a sperm, you'll need an egg, and you'll need a nice warm tummy to grow in, as we put it in our children's books. Um, so very often, for one reason or another, one of those ingredients is either missing or uh, not working properly, or um, there may be another reason why uh, it's just that co the combination isn't quite right. And so in those instances, um, people will need to think about could they use someone else outside of the family to help provide that missing ingredient. So in that sense, it is a different route to parenthood. So it's, it's, um, it's a, 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 you know, a, a, in a sort of standard family setup, there'll be, um, there'll be two parents, a mum and a dad, who are providing the sperm and the eggs, and the baby will grow in mum's tummy. Um, even if then one of the parents dies or the couple separate, or whatever, the, the, the family unit has a kind of clear boundary in that way in terms of its genetic roots. Um, whereas in this, this setup, there's, there's something a little bit different. There's another person who's included, and it's often a, a, um, a part of the struggle is to think, well, who is this person? Um, how important are they? How am I going to find them? How am I going to include them in the family story? Um, and so that's some of the issues that I'll be, I'll be covering and talking about. I think it's important to stress as well that there, because of the different route to parenthood that this is, um, there are some different implications in terms of donor conception for the long view of the whole family. 
Uh, so, you know, with IVF or with other fertility treatments, uh, the objective is to get the baby. And once the baby's there, to, to a large degree, the job is done. Um, and, 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 you know, we can have a glass of champagne to celebrate. Uh, for donor conception families, often the birth of the baby is really just the start of the of the some of the questions that might come up or some of the implications. And so because of that, the the, the, this route to parent movement might not be right for everybody. And I think it's really important that everybody gets a chance to think about how they feel about it, explore it, get support, come to us perhaps, to work out whether it is the right, the right way forward. Okay, just a quick overview of who, who uses donor conception and why. And I, I just, just really to give the, the, the broad picture because often people can get very stuck in their own story, in their own need for a donor and forget that actually lots and lots of different people might use donor conception. So it actually covers all family types. So heterosexual couples may be using donor conception. Same sex couples will, will be needing to use donor conception and single people will need to use donor conception. And the why, there can be a wide range of whys. So it might be to do with age. So there are lots of age related fertility issues that can affect people. Um, health related fertility issues can affect people. Uh, if, you're in a, uh, if you're a single person or in a same sex couple, then it may be that you simply have a missing ingredient, um, but it may even be more complicated than that. You know, we have, have single women, for example, in the network who've used double donation because they have fertility issues themselves. And then, so they'll need to use an egg donor, um, but obviously they're also, they're single, so they'll need to use a sperm donor. So it can be a combination of these things. And finally, sometimes people choose choose it as a they don't have fertility issues, um, but they want to bypass perhaps a genetic condition that's inherited through the family, and they may decide to uh, to use a donor to 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 sort that issue out of that problem. Okay, so what do people need to consider? I think the starting point will be: well, where are you on this journey to parenthood, to wanting to become a family? Um, some people may be right at the very, not even there yet, you know, it may be that you're just thinking if, if I'm going to have a family, this will be the way I'll need to do it and how would I feel about that. Um, other people might be already at a stage where they're, they're wanting to, to get on with it, they've maybe found a clinic um, and they just really want to work out what the things are that they need to consider if they're pursuing egg or sperm donation. So where are you and where, if that's an individual or a couple? Um, I think for couples and singles can have they can have different uh, questions and different issues that can come up or that can be more uh, high in the list of their of their concerns. So with a couple, very often the two people aren't on the same page at the same time. Um, and that can be an issue. So one person can be very keen to move forward, be very, very, very um, um, sure that donor conception is the right way forward. And the other person may be feeling more, more conflicted or hesitant, or even have some serious doubts about, about it as an option. So that can be a, a, an issue. If you're in a, a same sex relationship, um, there can be questions around who's actually going to contribute to the child. So who's going to tribute, contribute their sperm or their egg, who's going to go through the pregnancy. And that can sometimes cause elements of conflict or at least, you know, discussion, a, a question that needs answering. There can often also, because of the issue of, 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 of use, having to use the donor, um, there can be feelings around sort of equality in the relationship. So uh, will we both be real parents? If one of us hasn't contributed to the genes of this child, will, I, will they, that person still be considered a real, will they feel like a real parent and will they be considered a real parent? And for single people, um, it can be a, it can be a difficult journey sometimes. I mean, parenting, pregnancy, uh, fertility treatment, pregnancy, and parenting can be can be really tough um, tough for, for 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 people. And if you're on your own trying to manage all of that, it can be hard work. So there can be questions around um, who can you talk to, who can you get support from? Do you have the actual resources to do it alone? And again, that can still crop up that feelings of of, of am I the real parent if you if you're having to use uh, if you've got your own fertility issues and you're also having to use a, an egg or sperm donor um, as well as the, the, the in missing ingredient. I think some of this can be summed up um, that for many people that what they're actually having to do, this is where the loss comes in that I mentioned right at the beginning of the presentation. For a lot of people, it's a process of 
letting go of the child that they'd imagined they were going to have and that cannot be. Um, and then that process of letting go of that child, hopefully would give some space to consider or even allow in the child that could be and their different children. Um, and I think that process can take a different length of time for different people and there can be different elements to that process for different individuals, depending on what, you know, how they feel about the whole, the whole issue of, of genetic origins, fertility, parenting, family life. So I think in conclusion, all of those things, the, the, the question you're trying to work out is whether this option could be right for you. So then if you think that you might be moving forward uh, with considering this as an option, there'll be all sorts of other things to consider. So where are you going to have treatment? That might mean which clinic, but it might also mean which country. How are you going to choose the donor? On a more emotional level, uh, how much energy have you got to actually put into this? Uh, it can be quite a gru grueling process and all the decision making. Um, and it's it sometimes is worth sort of reflecting on how much energy you're, you've got uh, to, to, to move forward. Then, of course, there are some practical resources. Um, you're going to need money. You're going to need time. You're going to need support. Um, you know, it's, it's again, you know, it goes back to that idea that this is this is quite, quite a process for most people. And uh, it's worth having a think about those, getting a sense of 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 what what resources you've got to hand that are going to help you both through the decision making treatment and hopefully beyond pregnancy and a, and a, and a baby. Then it comes on to questions about telling and openness. Uh, for, for a lot of people, there can be a, a huge amount of anxiety. Okay, if I'm gonna have to use a sperm donor or an egg donor or surrogate, um, who am I gonna tell? Uh, how am I gonna tell them? Do I have to tell them? Uh, do I need to tell my child? And there's a strong sense for most people that this is private information. And for some people, it can feel irrelevant to them. So they can think, well, I'm gonna love this child regardless. I don't care where, it, where, where the genes have come from. This is my wonderful baby and I'm going to love it perfectly. Um, so it may feel very irrelevant, but it may not feel irrelevant to the child. Um, and it may not feel irrelevant to other people, which isn't to say that their views are take precedent over yours. It's more to just think about that in the bigger context, uh, particularly the feelings of the child. So that's a lot. There's a lot of things to think about, a lot of emotions to manage, a lot of, of, of complicated decisions. And it's a difficult one sometimes to think, well, where am I going to get the resources to help me with these decisions? Where to get support? And I think my conclusion to this section is the question to you, which is, does it all need to be perfect? I think for a lot of people, they have very high aspirations of, 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 of parenting, of themselves, of their, their choices. And I think it's really helpful sometimes to recognize that you know, with most big decisions in life, there's an element of compromise. And you've got to work out what is the core thing that you don't want to negotiate on, which will be different for different people. And what are the things that actually there's a little bit of room, wriggle room for you. Um, and to remember that it actually my, my, my answer to that was to say it doesn't need to be perfect. Families are not perfect. Parents are not perfect. Children aren't perfect. So it's quite a helpful, maybe quite a helpful starting point to give yourself some room to, to make those decisions without that pressure. Okay, so what feelings come up for people when they're considering donor conception? I think the biggest feeling for most people is a sense of grief. Um, there, there, there can be a, a real sense of loss on that, that, that lack of genetic connection to a child. Um, and, and the grief can come over for, for, for the person, if you're in a couple, who is contributing their genetic material, because very often that person would have wanted to make a baby with their partner. They didn't want to make the baby, you know, with a donor. Um, and so that can be a process that couples actually have to go through together. There can be a worry that they won't, people won't feel like the real dad or the real mum. Uh, and that may lead to fears that they won't bond. There can be a lot of anxiety, as I said, around telling and working out who needs to know. 
uh, there can be a sense that not really wanting to talk about it, maybe there's an element of shame or, or feeling that you're going to be judged and therefore would prefer just not to acknowledge it. And in, in DC Network, the way that we sum that up is, is to say that there are uh, privacy questions versus keeping secrets. And um, I think privacy and secrecy are quite close uh, they're, 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 and there's a, um, a, a sense that you, you can feel where you're, you know, you have information that uh, needs to be acknowledged to certain people, but maybe not to everybody. And, and, and it can be a difficult line to navigate. And for some people, there can be fear about this person, this donor, and who they are and what impact they may have on the family in the future. Just more broadly speaking, there are some other issues that can come up for people You're thinking about using a donor. Uh, there can be anxieties around medical questions that they won't be able to answer those on the donor's side. There can be a sense of, of, of sadness, not wanting to do it on our own for solo mums and dads. Um, for same sex couples, I've mentioned, you know, we were treated as equal parents. The lesbian partner who's not carrying the baby may say, well, will I feel like a mum if I'm not sharing that role? And just to finish with a slightly more positive spin, because I'm going to be mainly focusing on, on the sort of the, the challenges that come up for people. But remember that there can also be a real sense of joy and excitement that actually there is a way to have a baby. And for people that thought that there wasn't going to be a way to have a baby, that can be an enormous sense of excitement and, um, and put a much more positive framework to the whole question. Okay, I'm just going to recap a little bit on, uh, on, on the openness question, because that often is such a challenge for people. So at DC Network, we've got a whole range of resources to help people be open, and that openness can start right from the very beginning if people want. So while they're having treatment, if they want to sort of actually share with certain close friends, maybe close family members. Now, the reasons that we have for putting openness really at the heart of what we do is that, there, that there's a sort of um, a principled sense that secrecy is not a good basis, not a secure basis for family life in the long term. Uh, there's, we also feel that DC people deserve the truth about their origins. Uh, we would acknowledge to parents that um, although you might think it's going to be easy not to tell, and we'll just you know, why would we tell anybody? We'll just pretend it never happened. That actually it can be a much harder secret to keep than you think. The questions around family resemblances and um, the medical questions that, oh, where does she get that, 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 um, you know, beautiful singing voice from? None of you are very musical. Uh, and, and, and those, those questions that come up um, can just be constant reminders that actually there's something you're not sharing with those people, there's something you're not sharing with the doctor about the medical background. And, and, and that can feel very uncomfortable to people when they're actually trying to live that, uh, often much easier just to be open, actually. I'd say that research shows that telling young children is, is, um, is, 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 is fine, as in they can integrate that information into who they are. And I think that uh, certainly, you know, we don't know a huge amount in the donor conception world. There's not a huge amount of research that's been done. But one thing we know pretty conclusively is that the teenagers and adults who find out often by accident um, about their origins can feel a real sense of betrayal and mistrust. And the voices that we hear come back to us saying things like, how can I ever trust my parents again? And what else have they lied to me about? What they've lied to me about this? Um, and so just just to hold that, that that that's not a good place to be for a family. And to finally, it's sort of not not so much a principled issue, but a practical one. Um, the the impact of home DNA testing has totally transformed the landscape, really, for donor conception, and not just donor conception families, but for families. Um, so because people are so uh, excited about doing DNA tests, finding about their genetic connections, their genetic family, finding about their ethnicity, etc. And that can throw up all sorts of anomalies in, in, in families, including donor conception families, where they haven't been actually open about, about the truth of their child's uh, roots. Um, just to clarify as well that you, some people may be thinking, well, if my donor's anonymous, you know, uh, um, then why on earth would I, would I be telling them because I've got nothing to tell? Um, but I would still repeat that it puts honesty at the heart of the family. 
gives them an accurate picture of their medical history so that we're not going to get confused diagnoses or treatments based on misinformation. It helps to explain that difference in looks or temperament or talents. And again, the home DNA test testing means that even though there's nothing to tell perhaps about the donor, you just don't know what's going to be discovered in the future through that DNA testing. I think I'll just sum it up. Um, by saying that uh, that uh, uh, Dominic put it really beautifully, I think he's a dad through sperm donation. Um, he said, before our daughter was born, it was all about me and how unfair it was that I couldn't have my own genetic child. Now she's here, I see that it's all about her. And because I love her so much, I want to be honest with her about how she began. And I think that's quite a common journey for people that they may start off very hesitant about openness. But once a child arrives or the, they have a slightly older child, they can see that actually that, that, that it, 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 it might be helpful. It might be beneficial. We don't pressurize people in being open, but we support them in working out the right time for them. We have certain recommendations, certainly we, we think works well, but that is not a blanket rule for all families. And I think people have to find their own way with it. Uh, just um, to, 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 to conclude on the openness, well, why can it feel so daunting? Um, I think for most people, there can be a sense of embarrassment or shame about infertility or having to use donor conception. There's the issue of privacy that I've mentioned. They can feel that family or friends may judge them. Um, and indeed, family and friends may, may judge them, uh, which is where the building confidence comes. And that's where we would put uh, where we, we would put that role really, again, at the heart of some of the work that we do. Um, it can be a sense of, well, I don't know how to start. What words would I use? How on earth would I explain this story to a child or to my parents or to a, uh, you know friends that I have? Uh, and again, that's where we can come in. We've got lots and lots of resources to give you tools to be able to express and to share the family story in a very positive and proud way. Um, and then finally, yes, if, if, if the donor's anonymous, that can also be, be a bit uh, anxiety provoking, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So who are we and who can help you? Um, one of the places you can come is our organization. We're a charity founded over 35, uh, 25 years ago. Um, we have around, normally around 200, uh, sorry, 2000 parents and prospective parents, and as well as a group of donor conceived adults. And we offer peer to peer support. And the way that we would summarize that is that we are parent led but always child focused. So we've always got the idea that the child needs to be held in mind even before they, be, they, they actually arrive. And we're trying to pre prepare the whole family for, for, for how to integrate this into their story. Um, we've been the leaders in social and emotional issues around creating and building a family using donor conception. And I'd say that in all of that time, we've tried to be there from the very beginning when people first think they might need to use a donor. We want to be there for the whole family. That could be grandparents. It could be um, a wider community. Uh, we've, we've developed resources for, 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 for parents to take to school, etc. And we're there very much for the long view, you know, because we were founded so long ago lots of our uh, mem members and families who joined right at the beginning those children are now adults they've had children of their own so we've really got a sense of what happens to these families in the long term and what can help and what can support them so quick overview we've got a website that's the the front page with uh, various bits of information um, we've got books these are books for children called our story and they've got a whole range we've got about 25 different family types and donation types covered including surrogacy um same-sex couples lesbian couples where they've, they've done uh, they've done um reciprocal egg donations so one partner has donated their eggs to the other partner uh, and we've done non-clinic versions for sperm donation as well We've got telling and talking booklets. Those are for adults, for parents to help them explain to their children um, and to think about the how and the when and the why of explaining to their children. And we've got a series that follows the developmental stages. So young children, 0 to 7, uh, children a little bit older, 8 to 11, and then the teenage years and beyond. 
we run workshops. So we have preparation for work, for the preparation for parenthood workshops for people who are thinking about donor conception. We run telling and talking workshops for people who've had children if they want to explore how to how to start sharing the information. And we get fantastic feedback from our workshops. Uh, they really are, are are really excellent resources. So to finish off, so is donor conception right for you? I think that's both an individual question and if you're part of a couple, it's obviously a couple question. And that may be different as the answers. You will probably need some time to grieve before you can work out whether it is right for you. It may need time to think about how you feel about that genetic connection and genetic relation, relations within the family, as well as how you feel about difference. Uh, you might need to think about how you feel about this other person being involved in the creation of the family and how that person is going to be integrated into your story and potentially, depending on where you have treatment and how the future pans out, that that person might actually be, be a, become a real person um, that, that your child wants to meet or is able to meet. There can be questions around what do you want from this? You know, are you aiming to be a parent of a child or are you really only interested in being a parent of a child that's genetically connected to you, like a mini me? And, and, and those issues can be really difficult sometimes to sort out. Counseling can be very helpful. Um, and then finally, how do you feel about being open about this story? And that, that can also be, um, be a, a stumbling block. So what, what would you do to build your confidence, to help you make decisions and take your next steps? Um, I think the fact that you're coming on, a, on a, an, a webinar like this is great. So you're already starting to explore this topic. Uh, it's a big topic and it's really important. I mean, what's going to be more important to, to you than, than the decisions you make around having your child? Um, so you're doing the right thing already. I think invest more energy in this, come and talk to us, talk to friends and family if there are people that you trust about this, do some research, get counselling, talk with a partner if you have one. And I think the most important thing is probably to let those really difficult questions and feelings be explored. This is your chance. So remember and be kind to yourself as well. These are really important choices and decisions, but I imagine for most people, they're trying to make them at a time when they're actually feeling quite overwhelmed and under a lot of pressure. So it's not easy. So just allow yourself uh, a, a pat on the back. <laughs> um, this is the, you know, you're trying to do an awful lot to give yourself the space and time and support that you need. And just remember as well that you will make a decision at some point. So if you're feeling a bit lost, Trust that by doing these things, by exploring this option, you will come to a point where you know what the next step is and it doesn't need to be perfect. And it won't be perfect because parenting isn't perfect. So we have two lovely, um, lovely um, uh, posters that we had made a few years ago, which I think sort of sum up the whole thing. So these are real people, real family members. We've got a, a woman who had her child using an egg donor and a man who had his, his child using a sperm donor. And the, the captions are, not my egg, absolutely my daughter. And again, not my sperm, absolutely my son. And I think that, rec that recognizes the whole story, that there is a, there is a truth. Is that they didn't use their own eggs and sperm, but they are definitely their own children. And to conclude, a uh, nice message from Sam, one of our DC uh, donor conceived um, people who at the age of about 16 was at an event that we, we ran. Um, and he said, said to us, um, uh, uh, he was commenting on the conversations that he had with parents at, at our conference and just said, people seem to get so stressed out about it all. I think they should just chill out more. If they're anxious to do the right thing, they probably will do the right thing. And I think that could be summed up in another of our uh, things that we say, which is that it's your confidence that matters. If we can get you to a point where you can get yourself to a point where you feel confident about your, your decisions, then that will spill out and you'll be able to, as best you can, raise confident children. So I would just say, when you get to that point of decision making, embrace any final decision, whatever that is, and then relax and move forward. Thank you. 
So I'm, I hope I haven't gone too much over time and I hope I've covered all the things that were of use to people. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Nina. That was really interesting. Um, and hopefully it's given everyone who's joining us today a, um, a good overview of the process. Um, I, we had a, some questions submitted before as well as a couple that have come in while you were talking. Um, so I'm just wondering, I guess, just in terms of next steps, you know, if you have come along to this talk and you're thinking, okay, this does sound like something I would be interested in, and I suppose, say you're a woman and you were looking to find out more about donor sperm, where would you go? Or, I mean, vice versa, if you're a man and you think you might need, you know, to get your hands well, on smegs. I would, I, I would obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd say join DC Network. So come to us, um, partly because what we can do then is put you in contact with other people who've been down this path. So the, the most important, the most valuable thing I think people get from membership is that connection with other families. Um, and it can be enormously helpful and reassuring uh, to talk to people who are further down the journey, who've got children already. Um, how did they make their decision? What's working out well? What are they thinking about now, now that they're the other side of this journey? Um, so I would definitely, you know, come and come to our charity and, and sign up. Um, potentially come on a workshop. So we have those preparation workshops. Uh, so if you're a little bit more conflicted about it or want some more time to really build up that confidence, and then in terms of, um, you know, I don't know whether it's a practical question they're asking about where to go to actually mm. get this donor and to have this treatment. Um, that becomes really complicated because it depends so much on what it is that you're looking for. So treatment in the UK, for example, um, I would probably direct people to the HFEA, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. HFEA. Uh, so that is the, the regulator that, that, that basically looks after all um, and, and has oversight of all the clinics in the UK that are doing donor conception treatment. Um, and so they're, they're, they have uh, you know, a range of, of, of sort of resources and tools on their website, but they've got a clinic finder tool. So you can find the clinics that are located near to you. And then unfortunately, it does become a little bit of a um, you know, you have to be a bit of a, an energetic co consumer, customer, and mm -hmm. make contact with clinics and find the one that feels right for you. Um, having said that, I think that the um, um, the the contact with DC Network, what that would enable you to do is to speak to people who had who've, who've had different choices. So they've gone to different places, different clinics, maybe had different kinds of donors. Mm -hmm. um, people, if they're going abroad, then then it depends a little bit on what country they're looking at, what the legal situation would be like, what kind of costs you're talking about, what treatments are on offer. It's really it's such a big field um, that I would almost be tempted to say, hang on, pause, come to us first and talk to some people who've made different choices because mm. then they'll 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 signal to you well you can do it this way or this way or this way or this way and then you can start thinking about what the implications might be of those different directions to work out what's going to be most important to you you know for some people money is really really up at the top of the list so they've got a very you know smallish and finite budget mm -hmm. and so they're, they're, they're kind of working out what's going to maximize their chance of a healthy baby at the end um, for other people when they spend a bit of time thinking about it the thing that's on top of their list is that they have a, a donor who's identifiable they want to have that option for their child or for themselves um, in the future and so that becomes the, the, the top thing and, and, and that's what's so important uh, for other people it can be it can be the statistics of success rates um, it might be that you've already got a relationship with a clinic in a particular country or, or a particular clinic in, in the UK. And, and so that decision's been made, but you're trying to work out what donor to use. And then again, you know, for some people, the donor, the important thing might be their, their um, academic achievements. It might be their, the fact they look, they might be looking for someone who's going to fit in terms of looks wise in the family. Um, I mean, it's so personal, all of those yeah. things. It's, it's, it's just a jumble of, 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 of different, conf sometimes conflicting yeah. questions that people want to answer. And that's why 
you know, spending a bit of time and speaking to other people who've done it in different ways can be so, so valuable. So I'm not quite sure I've answered the question. No, so no, I think that's, I mean, that's the question too. It hasn't actually answered the question, then, then, then come back and flesh <laughs> it out a bit and I'll do my best. Definitely. I mean, uh, one, it's a sort of a more detailed question. A couple of people have asked, um, and you touched on it there, and if you were looking for a donor who perhaps fit with your family in terms of look. So are you able to choose the ethnicity of your donors? Uh, you should be able to yes okay. i mean the, the 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 problem comes with with joining all the dots together so if you go to a clinic um then it will depend a little bit on what is on offer from that clinic uh, and they don't tend to be hugely um cooperative on this 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 matter so you know if you're looking say for uh, an indian donor um, and you are with a clinic and they don't have an Indian donor. Hmm. They may not tell you that there might be another clinic up the road that does. And right. so this is where it can be really actually quite hard work as a, if, if you, you, know, you can be very lucky if you, you turn up at your clinic and they've got exactly the right thing that's on offer for, for you that you want. If that isn't the case, it can be quite a tough slog to, to find the, the, the good match. Hmm. Um, but yet, but in theory, yes, you should you should be able to have a say in that. Um, right. And what kind of do you have a sense of what sort of information you can get about your donor? Or does that vary from clinic to clinic? I mean, you mentioned academics. Can you find out how tall they are, the color of their eyes, whether their mother had any pre-existing medical conditions? Um, yeah, well, it depends where you go. Okay. Um, so that is a reason sometimes why people go ab abroad, because if you go to somewhere like the United States, um, you can get a huge amount of information about your donor um, that, that they, they they have a broader um, it's more the sort of customer customer choice. You can sort of choose whatever you like over there as long as you've got the right money. Mm. Um, and that can be a reason for people to choose to go outside of the UK because clinics in the UK, they have their own sort of protocols about how they share information and how they do the matching um, and it depends a little bit if they're if they're using a sperm bank then you'll be able to go to the bank and you'll be able to look at all sorts of information about the sperm donors um, but if they have their own donor program it may be that you're only offered a selection of, of perhaps one or two and only given limited information about about those donors but I think again it, it's it, it's sort of thinking what what is really important to you um and you know and also just to, to sort of remember that that for for for, for some for some there can be there can be a sense of pressure to choose the right donor um and that's that can also be a feeling of empowerment so people can feel like okay i've lost control of this whole process mm -hmm. the one thing that i can do is i can i can control the choice of the donor and make us you know the, the best choice i can and, and that's that's that that's how some people will feel and that's fine um but there can also be a sense that that you don't know anything you could choose a donor who's you know tall dark and handsome with who's got you know three phds and 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 just looks absolutely perfect on paper as you might choose your husband or something that yeah. way if you're a woman um and then you might end up with a with a child who has a disability or who's you know autistic um or just isn't you know didn't pick up those genes somewhere along the line and has taken after some other you know straggling remnant of of of, of, of the family heritage um and so there can be a, just a little bit of a note of caution in being being too limited by what you're what you're choosing that doesn't mm. help you um, actually and can be a little bit of pressure on the child that they you know they what did, if you chose them to have blue eyes and they end up with brown eyes is that is that a problem um, you know it's, it's so it's so it's sort of getting the balance right I suppose. Um, mm. And and remembering that this child is going to arrive as they arrive, and then yeah. um, and that can sometimes also be, take the pressure off having to choose this perfect donor who's going to make this perfect child. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, some other questions we've had were: um, How long does this take? So I 
I mean, I don't know the situation of the person who asked that question, but um, I suppose if you decided tomorrow that sperm or egg donation was for you and you wanted to go forward, how long would it be until you, I don't know, received <laughs> your sperm <laughs> or your egg? Well, unfortunately, like so many answers, um, it depends. <laughs> and I see there was a guaranteed answer. Have... Has COVID impacted this as well? Um, I think it has a little bit, just because obviously anyone who was traveling a, a, abroad, that would have mm -hmm. been impossible for, for, for a period. Because um, uh, lots of people go to Spain or go to um, the East European countries, go to America, uh, and that, that would have been limited. And the clinics did shut for a period in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. But they're all back up and running now. So, so um, it shouldn't, shouldn't have too much of an impact. Okay. Um, I think the problem with the answering that question is it's, it's a bit like if somebody said, you know, I'm trying for a baby, when will I have one? You know, you wouldn't be able to say, well, you'll have one by next Christmas because it might take them quite a long time to get pregnant. They might never get pregnant. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it's it's not inconceivable and it depends where you go. You know, if you go to a UK clinic, they may say the waiting list is three months, um, maybe six months. Uh, but that might be very valuable time, very valuable thinking and preparing time. But if you went to Spain, you might find that they say, well, I, you know, we can we can um, we can sort out treatment on Friday. Um, mm. So it does it does sort of vary. But that, that isn't always helpful because, like I said, you might need that time to really think about what it is that you want, what you're choosing. And that feeling of, of rush may not be um beneficial in the long term mm. but but we can't get you know we have some members where they've they've you know they've tried for years and years and years with a donor and just been unsuccessful and then mm. finally after eight rounds of IVF they they get pregnant um, okay. but you know much shorter time than that for most people yeah no that's that's great thanks um someone's there's a couple of related questions actually which you touched on earlier um in terms of cost. So, and I know you and I spoke about that when we were planning this webinar and again saying, oh, it kind of depends on cost. Um, it's very difficult. It depends, I guess, what you're looking for, which country you're in, which tests you need or decide to do. Um, so it can cost, but I mean, sort of thousands generally. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, it depends. Sometimes people have got their own sort of fertility issues that need sorting out. So they need to go through some tests or they might need to have some um, medication or whatever to, to fix that before they can even start treatment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're doing something like um, sperm donation with IUI, interuterine insemination, that's very low, low tech mm -hmm. uh, and very low cost. Well, low cost um, if you're going straight for IVF that is immediately with donor sperm that's immediately going to be more expensive and um, then if you want other 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 things done it depends on how many cycles you're going to have to go through it's it's very difficult to put a fixed price on it and and we tend to not like to do that because it is so varied and, and obviously mm. different countries have different price of prices so Again, unfortunately, for those issues, you end up again having to be a bit of a, um, of a of a customer going to different places to ask those questions. Yeah, um, to find out. Yeah, that makes sense. And in terms, if you were a woman who was looking for donor sperm, how much does the state of your health or your medical conditions? impact on your ability to do that so we've had some people um, who have say they're living with a secondary cancer diagnosis um, who are interested but also if you were technically in menopause perhaps because you've gone through cancer treatment so you might not be you know you might be in your 30s or early 40s but you're in menopause does that impact on your ability to participate in a donor um process I guess Do, how much is your health looked at by the clinics that you would go to um I think they I would hope that they would look at your health uh you know properly mm. um I think sometimes these things are unclear so it can be unknown why, why you know if the, you have somebody who seems perfectly healthy but they have recurrent miscarriage for example and it's not mm. clear why um 
and sometimes that can be to do with a sort of genetic mismatch with the embryo or with their partner um it, sometimes it can be just an unexplained um issue so i wouldn't like to i mean and i'm not medic medically qualified so i don't want sure. to sort of sort of make a statement about that but um but certainly if somebody is going through the menopause uh, prematurely um, or, or or not, uh, and are therefore using an egg donor, I mean, we, we have lots of members who have had very had successful pregnancies and and, and babies after that. Um, but it, I think it would be something you'd need to talk about with your clinician mm -hmm. and perhaps raise it with them as as something that that you want to be you want to be sure that you're getting the best chance of a pregnancy and and that the whole the whole of you has been looked at not just the fact that you might need to use a donor but that you you know you're you're being um checked as well sure yeah no, that makes sense and if anyone is interested we did do a video uh session with surrogacy uk at our shine connect conference um a couple of weeks ago and that video is on our youtube channel so i can send out the link um to all of you after this um but that this th might be a good um or sorry that might be a good follow-up to this webinar if you're interested in different types of you know donors and surrogacy and that kind of thing um there's another question somebody's asked are there places that you can go to for financial support with donor conception and are you able to get a donor egg on the nhs do you know um i'm not aware of any way you can go to for financial support but you and the nhs um unfortunately is a postcode lottery mm. so some areas of the uk you will get nothing um and some areas of the uk you will get something um up to quite a lot uh and it depends where you live it depends on the decisions of the, the ccg and that those decisions change periodically so it's not always uh, a fixed playing field even then mm. um but you you it's certainly worth if you're going to a private clinic and they're advising any tests or medication or um particularly sort of tests that could be done on the nhs is is to I, I would start by perhaps going to see your GP and just mm -hmm. just at least making that connection and then you may find that you can get some of the tests done on the NHS as a, as a minimum um, and you may find that actually there is some funding through through depending on where you live um, it, it would be nice if it was an even playing field frank, frankly yeah and I guess that's also I mean I know people who have been sort of initially told they wouldn't be eligible for any kind of fertility support and then have sort of advocated via their GP to their CCG and have managed to get some. So it's worth definitely. It's definitely worth pushing for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. Um, another question is, again, two related questions. So one, do you legally need to tell your children if they're conceived using donor egg or sperm? You don't, okay. You know, and then so the other question is, are there any legal aspects people need to be aware of in terms of using donor sperm? And I suppose that's, I don't know, are there any claims to parenthood from donor, donor egg, the donors of eggs or sperms on your child if they're conceived? Uh, so if you go through a licensed clinic, mm -hmm. which you would do if you're doing egg donation, because obviously that's quite a complicated um, um, clinical procedure that you'd have to do in a clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're doing sperm or egg donation through a clinic, even if the donor is known to you, so you have a friend or somebody that you've met um, that you, you, you've you decided um, you, you'd like them to be the donor, if you take them to the clinic, they are they're protected by law. They're not um, responsible over for the child, but they also don't have any rights over the child. Um, and you would be the, the 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 parents, and the child would would be in your your care and 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 um, and your responsibility. If you have treatment outside of a clinic, so you perhaps do find somebody um, a sperm donor. This would have to be who you then use um, their sperm at home. Mm -hmm. Then the law is much more unclear. I mean, legally, they would be the legal father um, in some in, in one sense, but it would be very murky as to whether they would have 
any responsibility or rights over the child and that would probably be a court case that would decide that mm -hmm. um but we tend to that's partly why we tend to recommend not doing that or that mm -hmm. if you are going to do that that you at the very least um you go and see a see a lawyer come to us see a lawyer and um clarify with the donor what you and their understanding is of how this relationship is going to work and you try and map out as much detail as possible mm. including how you're going to navigate any challenges that might come up so things where you change your mind over something or situations where um, the child has a voice in, in as a child grows up and the child decides they'd like something different to what you and the donor had arranged and planned um, or uh, and, and you know communication was an issue that you hadn't discussed so get it as much written down as possible for clarity and then even if it, it may not stand up in a court of law the 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 the, the, the you know it's, it's not a legal legally binding document but at least you've got something that shows what your intentions were and it's written black and white and it also gives you a chance to process all of that to really force you and the donor to sit down and think through what the what what it is that you're hoping for and make sure you're on the same page and 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 have done that work before you have before you have the baby um would be my recommendation but yes i mean the, and lawyers can be really helpful for this although they can be a bit expensive but yeah that sounds a little bit like a um i know surrogacy uk has people drop a surrogacy agreement as well which just takes you through all that thinking about various scenarios that might not have occurred to you um, so that you can think them through and then come to an agreement. So yeah, that's that's really And great. really to think about the difficult stuff as well, because it yeah. can be a heady mix of like, wow, I'm gonna have a baby and I love the donor. They're so amazing and so kind and generous and we're all getting on so well, it's all brilliant. Um, and you know, long may that continue, but mm. we know how relationships work. And this is a relationship that potentially is going to go on for 40 years, you know, through the course of this child's life even if the relationship is very very distant yeah. and um and so you know people's lives change people feelings change uh, relationships can go through tricky patches and and so you need to be you need to have something robust at the bottom of uh, at the foundation of all of this that you can you can lean on if things do get a little bit rocky yeah that's great thanks nina um other question someone has asked how much is it to join donor conception network do you become a member of dc yeah it's about 50 pounds a year okay um and we we never want finances to be a barrier to support and so if if people can't afford 50 pounds there's a little bit more for couples a little bit less for single people um then we do offer also an unwaged fee uh or you know we're, we're happy to we we, we yeah we need we need we need an income to support the charity, sure. but we don't we're not uh, we're not trying to exclude people. Yeah. Um, and actually, one more question, just related to the issue, I suppose, about the, the situation of the the you know, mother or the father. But are there any age limits on donor conception? Uh, yes, there are. Um, okay. In the UK, um, you there are age limits on uh, to women. I think. Um, roughly capped at the age of 50 so some okay. clinics a little bit above that some clinics may cut off a little bit below that it's around about 50 uh in the uk and i think that's part of sort of related they've, they've they've done that measuring against an average uh average menopause so the the, the age at which a woman could conceivably have the child without help and that's 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 where they've kind of come up with roughly that 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 bar um but they are yeah so that, that, okay that's so that's if you're a woman and you're looking for a donor egg or sperm or embryo to be implanted in you the age limit is about 50 yeah okay i guess there's not going to be the same issue i'm thinking with men in any way there wouldn't be would there <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know i don't know if there would be issues say if a single man in his 60s yeah um, I'm not sure whether they would, that, you know, this is a new, uh, a single, single men haven't been able to um, um, use, use a clinic to have, have, a, have a child until very recently. So, mm -hmm. so that's, yeah, I'm not sure. 
Okay, that's one for <laughs> one for us to think about. Um, well, we are just about out of time. If anyone's got any other last minute questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. Otherwise, I think we will wrap up. Um, I think I've got to all of the questions that we had. Um, yeah, so um, we will put this video, we'll do a little bit of editing on the video and then we will share it, <coughs> excuse me, on our YouTube channel. Um, and if anyone does have anything else that they would um, like to find out, please feel free to drop us an email at hi at shinecancersupport.org. We can put you in touch with the Donor Conception Network. Um, I'll make sure to send out their details as well on the evaluation form, which I will be sending to everyone too. So please fill that in as well, because that just helps us know, um, you know, what we could do differently next time or what we did well this time. Um, but Nina, thanks so much um, for this. It's been really informative and um, I'm sure we'll be working together again. Well, my pleasure. Yeah, Thank perfect. you, everyone.